Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're going to return to another resource that we got in large quantities from the Guardian Farm that we tackled last week, except this is not something that necessarily came from the Guardians themselves. This is something we got in the process. I'm talking about the two shulker boxes of kelp <laughs> that we received as a result of clearing out such a large area of ocean. And if you've been swimming around the oceans in your own world, chances are you've encountered a great deal of kelp yourself. If you've broken it, you probably get a large quantity of it and you can regrow it using bone meal, at which point you probably wonder, what the heck am I supposed to do with all of this kelp? Of course, kelp can be placed anywhere you have water. Basically, if the water covers the full block, like in the case of a water source here or in a falling column of water, it is possible to grow a single piece of kelp there, and that single piece of kelp will even convert flowing water into a water source, as we saw in the Guardian Farm setup episode. So you could use kelp to decorate some waterscapes if you want a bit more light in your underwater scenes, but that is not necessarily the primary use of kelp, because it has a use on the other end of the spectrum that we might not have considered up until now. Over here, we can throw some kelp into a furnace, where you'll notice it begins smelting. In fact, it will be faster to do this in a smoker, so I might convert these last two furnaces on the row here to smokers. Just gotta grab four logs for each furnace and convert those, there we go. And the reason that kelp can be put into smokers in the first place is that dried kelp, the product from smoking, some kelp is actually a food source. We can't eat it right now because my food is currently full. I'm not particularly hungry, but we can get hold of a bunch of this and use it as a snack. I say a snack because dried kelp really doesn't restore a great deal of hunger points. There we go. If I take a little bit of damage, my hunger will drain once again, and we should be able to eat some of this. Just going to run and sprint around. There we go. We get a shank of hunger open, and there we go. There's two. All right. So if we eat one piece of kelp, it only restores half a point of hunger, or I guess one point of hunger, because technically each of those shanks of hunger in the meter there is two points. And you'll also notice that the saturation drains away pretty quickly, so we end up having to eat a great deal of kelp in order to restore the last few points of hunger, and once I start sprinting around again, I'll get hungry again pretty quickly. And you might have noticed from that that the animation was a little bit faster than eating another piece of food, and kelp, for whatever reason, has the distinction of being the fastest food a player can eat. But since it's not all that good at actually restoring your hunger and your saturation, it's not really viable as a food source if you have other sources of food. However, the other thing we can do with dried kelp is a lot more useful. If we head over to a crafting table here and turn nine dried kelp into a 3x3, that becomes a dried kelp block. And these have a multitude of uses. They can also be considered storage blocks, considering that if you put them back into a crafting interface, you can get nine dried kelp back out, in the same way that you can with stuff like iron blocks. So in terms of the sheer amounts of kelp that we have taking up room in the shelker boxes, we can actually convert a row of this into a stack of kelp blocks, and they will take up a great deal less space. Kelp blocks are also possible to use as building blocks, and they have a really interesting color. You don't get much of this darker green palette in Minecraft, so it's kind of neat to have those. They have that vertical stripe as though the whole thing has been sort of packaged up and it's tied with string. I believe much like sponges and hay bales, yep, there we go, the hoe is the ideal tool to break kelp blocks, breaking them instantly. Or perhaps it's not instant if you don't have a super efficient hoe, but either way, kelp blocks are, I think, an underrated building block. They've got quite a lot of potential for interesting designs, they are unusual, you wouldn't see them used in building a great deal, which means you can use them to interesting effect, and it's not going to be immediately obvious to the casual observer what they are, since they aren't really seen everywhere in the same way that, say, logs and cobblestone are. But of course, the other fascinating thing about dried kelp blocks is that they can be used as fuel, and quite an effective fuel as well. A single block of dried kelp will actually smelt 20 items before the fuel runs out and you need to add another one, meaning that a stack of kelp blocks placed inside a smoker will actually smelt 1,280 items before the stack runs out. Naturally, since you can only stack items to 64 in the input slot of a furnace-type block, you will need to have some sort of hopper set up like the automatic furnace that we have in here. But we've been using lava buckets in here for a while, and lava buckets can only smelt 100 items. Which I say only, that's the largest amount that any fuel source can on its own. But of course, lava buckets are not stackable. If we want to put lava buckets into these fuel input hoppers, we can only manage to fit five in there, plus one lava bucket in the furnace for a total of 600 potential smelted items before you need to completely refill it. Now consider that that's about half as much as a full stack 
stack of kelp blocks and that would only take up one slot in the furnace fuel slot here so that's a consideration when you're deciding what fuel to use and dried kelp blocks can be incredibly effective at that. In fact the only more effective stackable fuel source in Minecraft currently is coal blocks which can smelt 80 items each and will also stack to 64 but have to be made out of a 3x3 of coal. And since for the most part coal is a resource that you have to mine from the environment around you unless you're farming with the skeletons for the stuff it can be considered fairly finite. It's the kind of thing that you'd have to go further and further afield as you deplete the coal around you in this area. Whereas right now we can set up a very effective renewable kelp farm that will provide us with a renewable source of kelp blocks. The only disadvantage I personally see with using kelp blocks is the fact that the player has to step in and manually craft the kelp blocks so you can't just let a kelp farm produce kelp in the background, dry it out and somehow have it automatically converted into kelp blocks to be used as a furnace. But that has the potential to change with the next Minecraft update which we already know is going to contain a redstone powered automatic crafting block. The crafter will be something that we can add on to the output of a dried kelp smelting setup like this and it will automatically convert the kelp into kelp blocks which could then be fed into a furnace array. And we likely won't see that for a few months because Minecraft 1.21 is still in development. But in the meantime we can get ahead of the game by learning how to create a fully automatic kelp farm. And that will provide us with a fuel source which arguably is even better than lava from a set it and forget it kind of perspective. And additionally, of course, a cool set of building blocks. So since kelp is one of the green resources, we're going to set that up over in our green resources corner alongside the bamboo farm, the sugarcane, the melons and pumpkins and the cactus. To begin with, we're going to need to bring along some building blocks. And in this case, I think I'm going to make the farm out of spruce logs. Since I have a great deal of those already, we can break those down into spruce planks and that will get us plenty of material. I'm also going to grab some glass here so that we can see into the farm. And just like our guardian farm, I think I'll dye some of this glass blue. So let me grab some lapis since I'm fairly certain I've depleted some of the blue dye that we've already used in the past. And we'll turn a bunch of the glass here into blue stained glass. That should do for now. And one of the reasons that I haven't opened up this chest is because I currently can't. I'm in the process of converting all of my dyed block storage here into shulker boxes, but that's taking a while since I need to free up some of these shulker boxes in order to do that. And so now I can't open this top row of chests here underneath the four shulker boxes I've already made. Eventually I wanna make this entire corner and that entire corner out of shulker boxes, but that's gonna require 96 shulker boxes that just stay here. So it's gonna take a little while to get hold of all of those. Anyway, the last thing we need to do to make sure we've got everything we need for this farm is to craft a bunch of pistons and a Observers. I've got 20 observers waiting for me in here, but only six pistons, and we will need a great deal of those. We'll actually need one per kelp plant growing, and this is the kind of farm that you can scale up or shrink down as much or as little as you need. So if it's going to be constantly producing kelp in the background, you don't necessarily want to go full industrial with this thing, but you do want to make sure you've got enough kelp plants that it is worth setting this thing up in the first place. So I'm going to grab some quartz. We're going to craft another stack or so of observers just to make sure that we have enough. And this is one of the reasons that I've been farming so much cobblestone lately because we will need six stacks of cobblestone just to make all of those observers. We'll also need two stacks of redstone dust so I'll make sure we got all of those and there we go all of those resources gone in an instant. Now we're going to do the same thing with pistons which need four stacks of cobblestone in order to craft them and let's grab a bunch of the spruce planks we already made so we should be able to make about a stack of pistons. There we go so that should be everything we really need for this farm. A bunch of redstone, the redstone components being pistons and observers, a handful of kelp so that we can grow that in the farm and some building blocks that we can use to decorate. So up here next to the cactus farm, we're going to start digging a trench in here and we're going to maybe dig this a couple of blocks into the ground, but then build up the structure of the farm outside of this. I've dug it out nine blocks long in a V shape like this. So there's a central trench and then two blocks to either side of it. And we're going to flood this entire thing with water. Once we've done that, we can place kelp along all of these blocks and we could probably actually turn these into spruce wood since we're going to be building the farm out of those. Also to demonstrate that kelp can be planted on any solid surface as long as it's underwater. So it doesn't matter that we're planting this on top of wooden blocks, it'll grow just the same. That might have been obvious from places you can already see kelp out there in the world. It grows from the top of ocean monuments and shipwrecks, so there's no problem growing it from the top of spruce planks here. The structure of this farm is going to take a very similar shape to the sugarcane and bamboo farms that we've already designed because the kelp is going to be covered 
cut off once it grows by a piston, and that is going to be detected. The structure of this farm is going to be very similar to the bamboo and sugarcane farms that we have already made, because the kelp is simply going to grow naturally, it's going to be cut off by a piston, and detected once it reaches a certain height by an observer. So I'm going to fill in the blocks underneath where I plan to place the pistons with some more spruce planks, and then we'll just do a row of pistons across here, a row of pistons across here on the other side, and then we'll place observers facing inwards. From this point on, of course, we'll need to flood the two blocks above for the kelp to grow up that high, so we're going to make sure that there is some kind of case on the front of this made out of stained glass in this case, and I'll probably replace a few blocks below here as well so that the glass looks like it goes into the ground. We haven't wired up the redstone yet, so doing this to the observers is not really going to do a whole bunch, but once we filled in that corner, the entire thing should flatten out, and these are now all solid water sources. The kelp, as you can see, is already growing further upwards. And of course, in order to have any of these observers trigger the pistons below, they're going to have to have a row of redstone dust coming out of the back of them, supporting these planks, which are also going to conduct the redstone signal, firing the pistons every time one of the kelp plants grows to three blocks high. Now in the bamboo farm here, we actually covered how to have these pistons fire individually. Thanks to the Java edition property of redstone quasi-connectivity, where a block that's powered here can diagonally power the piston that's breaking the piece of bamboo, with a note block here to provide an update, and that will make sure that each of the pistons fires individually. But we actually don't want to take that approach with the kelp farm. And the reason for that comes down to the manner in which kelp ages, which I'll explain in a second once I've set up the redstone on this side of the farm. Oh, there we go. Our entire right-hand side of the farm has just harvested, breaking off a bunch of the kelp plants. So I'll gather up a little bit of this floating kelp, and I'll explain a bit about how the age of these kelp plants works. Each kelp plant is given a randomly assigned age value when it is initially planted. Right here, we can take a look at it in the targeted block data on the right-hand side, where it says that this piece of kelp has an age of 8, but this one next to it has an age of 18. 23 on this side, 21 right there, and 0 over here. The maximum age a kelp plant can grow to is 25, and the initial planting of the kelp, the initial sprout from which the rest of the plant grows, will never be given an age of 25. The maximum it can be given is an age of 24. In fact, this plant on the end here, coincidentally, has an age of 24. So the thing is, this plant is only ever going to grow up one block from where it is currently planted, meaning that it will never actually reach this observer, and will only ever just grow in front of this piston, at which point the plant will detect that it has reached age 25 and will stop growing. This is really a built-in mechanic to allow kelp to grow in a sort of more random pattern. In a large group of kelp, it allows for enough randomness that there are going to be 25 possible outcomes for how tall a plant can grow. But in this farm, of course, it would present a bit of a problem. Because if this plant was to be broken individually by the pistons here, it would never reach that observer and would thus never end up being broken. So let's take a look at the ages of each of these kelp plants here. Now this one is at 24, that one is at 11, that one here is at 14, 18, 13, 2, and 22. So when we end up breaking each of these with a piston, the plants underneath get their value randomly assigned once again. So if we place a block in front of this, it's going to break all of the kelp as it grows. And now this one here is 23. That one is 15. This one is 20. This one is 22. This one that already grew is 10. That one is 17. And the one on the end here is 14. So the numbers have been randomly reassigned to each of these kelp plants. So if one of our plants, like this one on the end, only has the capacity to grow up one additional block, its age is eventually going to be reset by one of the other plants growing. We should never end up with a bunch of plants that are never going to grow high enough to trigger the observers. One other interesting thing to note about this farm is that when the pistons actually fire, let's say we trigger this one manually, right now each of these blocks here technically is occupied by falling water, by flowing water instead of a full water source, and that is because the piston heads have fired out here, temporarily occupied this block, and since piston heads cannot be waterlogged in Java Edition, we end up with a situation where they eliminate the water source blocks on this side. This can potentially lead to some kelp items floating down towards the bottom of the farm, and it prevents them from floating to the surface, where eventually we're going to collect them in a series of hoppers and water streams. However, this problem will be resolved as soon as one of the other kelp plants in this row grows. As you can see, the kelp is able to float up to the surface from that point onwards because, of course, the kelp growing into this falling water space turns it back into a water source, like we saw with the Guardian farm. 
Alternatively, if you want to make sure all of the water sources automatically fill in so that your kelp rises to the surface before any of these other plants have time to grow, we simply need to break out this last block in the row here and fill that with water. Now, whenever any of the pistons fire and break those water sources, the water source at the end here should form a diagonal with the water source next to it, and all of these spaces here should be filled in with water sources. You won't find any more falling water generating here. So there we go, that's a pretty in-depth look at the mechanics of this farm. Now we're going to build up another layer of it, so we need to build up some solid blocks around the outside. And we're going to build exactly the same setup with pistons and observers, only this time the row of kelp, instead of being planted on a regular solid block down here, is actually going to be planted on top of the observers that are detecting the previous row of kelp growing. We once again have to do the awkward dance of filling this entire area with water sources, but once all of that is in place and the redstone is wired up, we can just go ahead and plant some more kelp. And at this at this point we have 32 plants all producing kelp in here. We can add another row to this if we want to, but of course the thing that's worth bearing in mind here is that each time we do this it's going to take more and more resources both to decorate the farm and to fill in the water sources in the centre. It's going to become a more and more laborious task. So I think personally I'm going to wrap this up with 48 plants all growing here. And as with the levels below, I'm going to make sure that there's a water source adjacent to each of these rows of pistons just to make sure that the flowing water can get filled up with solid water sources, and all the broken kelp items can rise to the top without any interference from those flowing water patches. Of course, once all of the kelp rises to the top, we want to make sure it makes it into a collection system, and while we could put a line of hoppers through the centre and have water streams converging in the middle, which would help the farm stay kind of symmetrical looking, Unfortunately, as some of the kelp rises, there's a chance of it getting caught underneath the hitbox of those hoppers and never being collected. So we're going to do this a different way, which is actually helped by the scale of this farm. We've actually kept it relatively small, and so we should be able to run a water source over the top of this area and have it drop down into a collection mechanism on one side. So to cap off this side of the farm here, we're going to have a row of solid blocks placed against here. We'll continue the stained glass along the top here, and then I'm going to grab two different types of ice. We'll need some regular ice so that we can fill up the top of the tank and place some water streams over the top of it like we did with the Guardian farm, and I'm going to grab a few blocks of blue ice so that the kelp can slide over the top of these to reach the collection system. Because once these water streams travel eight blocks, they're going to make it over the top of these observers, but then of course the items have to go somewhere, and right now this redstone wiring for this side of observers is actually in the way. So we're going to be changing that up ever so slightly to make it possible for the items to continue traveling. We're going to place a line of these solid blue ice blocks along the back of the observers here, and then one block below that, leaving a gap between the observers and the pistons, we're going to alternate between a piece of redstone dust and a note block. And this should actually prevent any kelp plants growing on here from locking up, since if we had a full line of redstone dust down here, it would work kind of the same as the bamboo farm, where it only triggers through quasi-connectivity and only triggers one piston, but with the note blocks in here, those plants will simply trigger a single piston push on their own, but with the redstone dust alternating, that should trigger two pistons, which should make sure that the ones that can only fire a single piston are still going to be broken every so often anyway. Hopefully some of that made sense. Anyway, I'm going to disable these observers by removing the redstone dust so that we can fill the entire top layer of this with ice, and we are once again going to place some water streams up here so that an entire row of water streams flows towards these observers. And any kelp that flows up into the top half of the farm here is simply going to hit this water stream, be pushed over, flow neatly over the blue ice, and it'll go into a water stream that'll collect everything in a hopper. Now we can go back in, make sure I have the fortune pickaxe and not the silk touch one equipped, and break out all of this ice so it reverts back into water sources. Already we're seeing the kelp come to the surface, it should flow neatly over the edge of the ice there, perfect, and we can restore the redstone on this side to allow the farm to operate again. Alongside this blue ice, just to make sure the kelp doesn't fly out, this side of the farm, we're going to build a wall with a single water stream tray here. We're just going to place an ice block down the end here, break that, and that's going to flow towards the end here, and that can where if we want to, we can wall this off so the kelp items simply fall down, and once they reach this point, we'll collect them in a hopper, and we can channel them into an automatic set of smokers. For the moment, I think we'll just collect all of the kelp output in a chest, and we'll make sure that everything actually goes into this hopper, because item momentum is a weird thing, and sometimes it's not necessarily going to hit this block here, it's just going to fly diagonally outwards and not land in the hopper. But we'll stand up here for a second so that we can see the farm in action. Sooner or later, one of these rows of pistons is going to fire, and all of the kelp plants should 
drift up to the top. There we go. Those fly up, they end up landing in the water stream here, and it looks like a lot of that should now have fallen down there. Although, yep, it does seem like some of it has overshot slightly, so we should maybe consider blocking this tube off for a second here so that they can be more directed in how they fall. Now, this next batch of kelp coming up here should have no choice but to fall into the hopper. Yep, looks like that worked out splendidly. And after a short while, the kelp is now collecting in this chest. We've got 11 in there already, and I can start to stash some of the kelp plants that I picked up during the process of building this farm. Naturally, we might want to do a little bit more here in terms of decoration in future. Like, I always think these look like the hull of a ship, so it'd be kind of fun to do some decorative stuff with that, turn this into a landlocked shipwreck or something. But really, the next stage of a farm like this is going to be attaching a bunch of smokers to this whole thing so that the kelp can automatically be turned into dried kelp. We can come and collect that and turn them all into kelp blocks whenever we want to. Okay, time to build ourselves a smoker array. And to begin with, I've placed a hopper in the output area of this kelp farm so that we've got the hopper feeding down into a buffer chest which is just going to store any kelp that isn't being actively smelted at the time. We're going to have that feed down into what I'm thinking of as the feed chest for the remainder of the smoker array, because we're going to have that fed by a hopper minecart. While we could have this hopper simply output into a smoker, my goal here is to use the fuel in these smokers efficiently. I actually want to use the dried kelp blocks that the farm generates to automatically power the smoker that's going to be producing more dried kelp. And our goal is to use that amount of fuel effectively without any waste. So since a single dried kelp block will produce 20 smelted items, we want to make sure that it's smelting batches of 20 kelp at a time. The capacity of a hopper or a hopper minecart is five slots. Each can hold 64 items, so that's going to mean a total of 320 items, a number which is quite conveniently divisible by 20. That means if we set up eight smokers, then each of these smokers will receive 40 items from the full output of a hopper or a hopper minecart. So we're going to have a hopper minecart running over these eight smokers, delivering the kelp directly to the them and then returning to the chest once it is completely empty. This is going to involve setting up a more complex piece of rail than we have done before. It's also going to involve our first use of detector rails in combination with comparators to detect the contents of a hopper minecart. I originally expected us to use this space next to the farm where it'd be nice and discreet to set up the rails, but I think that was going to be slightly too close to the redstone for the farm. So to avoid interfering with that, we're actually going to build it sideways here into the cliff and we can terraform and cover that up if we feel like it looks too messy. And the first thing I'm going to do is set up a handful of blocks here, which are going to effectively stop the minecart when it rolls underneath this chest. The idea is that we're going to have a detector rail roll up underneath this chest at a diagonal like this, which is possible to have even if there isn't a rail here so that the minecart won't roll any further and it will stop against this block. However, you have to be careful about when you place these because if you place any other rail adjacent to that, it will flatten out if it's not connected to anything further up the slope. So we're going to save that detector rail for a little bit later and start working with this powered rail, pushing the minecart out into the circuit. The next thing we're going to do on these temporary blocks here is test which way a set of curved tracks is going to connect. So we're going to place some curved tracks right here on this rail. And as you can see right there, it connects to this rail by default instead of connecting to the rail to my left here. So we're going to have the powered rail travel down here. Of course, we're going to have that loop back around at the end. And we need to make sure that this piece of rail here actually gets diverted to loop the minecart back around this circuit if it still has content. This is a cool aspect of minecart rail, is that you can actually control which direction it is facing using a redstone current. So right here, we can connect it to either this rail or that rail next to it. If we either power the rail itself with an adjacent redstone power source, or if you power the block that the rail is sitting on, that andesite block down there. And since the minecart is going to be traveling this way around the circuit, it's going to be going kind of clockwise, we want to make sure that a detector rail somewhere around here is going to detect that the minecart still has contents. Although a detector rail is still a redstone power source, and when it detects a minecart over the top of it, it will automatically switch that track around. So I think we actually need to make sure the detector rail is at least one more block away. So we're going to have the detector rail here with a piece of normal rail connecting it back onto this track. And when we place the detector rail here, that one's not going to change. What we are going to do, though, is set up something that 
confirms whether or not the hopper minecart has any contents and will change the direction of this rail if it still needs to continue feeding items into the smokers. And we're going to be doing that by use of a comparator. The comparator is going to sit here detecting this detector rail. It's going to light up every time this hopper minecart has any contents and that's going to send a signal to a circuit which will switch the points on this track here. That's going to be simple enough. We'll place a piece of redstone dust there so that any signal is going to be boosted by this repeater. The repeater is going to power this piece of redstone dust and that's going to switch the points for us so that any time the minecart rolls over that powered rail it's going to switch the direction of this rail if the minecart still has stuff in it. We're going to set up our smokers underneath this section of powered rail here so we're going to dig away the blocks underneath this making sure we have room for both the smokers and the hoppers that will go on top of them. And finally Finally, I've been able to uncover where this cave is so I can light it up and prevent all of the zombie noises I've been hearing so far. And as I was saying, we're going to put the smokers underneath here. We'll deal with the cave stuff in a second, but we're going to put the smokers in here for now. We're going to put the hoppers facing downwards into these smokers input. We'll connect up all of this with the powered rail and we'll make sure that this rail is powered by some sort of adjacent redstone power source. In this case, I think we are just going to put two blocks over the top of these and power those using levers, which when we switch those on. There we go. The powered rail will light up completely, allowing the minecart to proceed around this circuit anytime it wants to. Now we're going to set up the detector rail here, like so, and we're going to break off that block and place a solid block there to make sure the minecart doesn't roll up and over this section of detector rail. We're going to place a fence gate here, which is actually going to prevent the hopper minecart from rolling away from this little setup until it's full, because the way that we're going to have this work is that while the minecart is on here, it's going to be detected by another comparator. The comparator is going to have a side input signal, probably coming from a redstone torch or some similar power source, which is going to provide a 15 strength redstone signal. That will make sure that the comparator only outputs any redstone signal when it detects the container behind it is full. And that means the hopper minecart that is attached to this detector rail. We're going to have that signal go up a block here, making sure it doesn't connect to this redstone dust, and that's going to power this fence gate, opening it when this comparator switch is on. So whenever the hopper minecart is full, the gate opens and it can roll down into the circuit, delivering items to this set of smokers. And remember, every time it reaches this detector rail, if the minecart still has contents, that's going to flip this rail here and prevent it from returning to pick up more kelp, meaning that it'll only ever deliver a set amount of kelp to these smokers before it has to continue. All of the elements for this should now be in place, so we're going to try that out. We'll place the hopper minecart underneath here. You'll notice that the detector rail here powers the piece of powered rail next door. The hopper minecart is slowly going to fill up with kelp, actually quite quickly, because hopper minecarts do operate very quickly. And once the hopper minecart is full, we should see it roll away around these smokers, and every time it rolls over this detector rail, there we go, the track switches, and the hopper minecart continues around the circuit. Now it's delivering all of the items to the smokers here. We should be able to take a look in one of the smokers. There we go, it's receiving one item every time the hopper minecart goes over the circuit. And once this smoker has filled up with 40 items, the hopper minecart should be empty and we should see it return to this gate here. There we go, and then it's ready to fill up with even more kelp to return that to the smokers. I'm going to break the hopper minecart for now since the smokers don't have any fuel in them yet, so they're not even producing dried kelp. And I'll need to set up a bunch of additional hoppers here, both for a fuel input and so that the dried kelp can be collected. And while the circuit is stopped, I'll also make sure that all of my redstone components here are on blocks of andesite so that I can really obviously see where they are. Our series of hoppers is going to run directly underneath the smokers like so, collecting the kelp from the output and also making sure we don't run any underneath this point because that's where we're going to be inputting the fuel into the farm and we don't want that to be drained out of the hoppers before it can reach the smokers. We could also set up another minecart track here to make sure that each of these hoppers has fuel fed into it evenly once we've started producing all of the kelp. But for now, I'm just going to throw one kelp block into each of these hoppers so that the smokers start working and each of their outputs should end up going into the chest here. We'll leave a crafting table down here at ground level so we can easily craft the output into more dried kelp blocks and this farm should be able to produce roughly twice as much fuel as it uses. And once we have it running more permanently, the hopper minecart is going to be busy for a while because I still have these two shelker boxes of kelp that I need to smoke. Now to begin with, I am going to need to babysit this farm a little bit because of course we need to have enough fuel fed into each of the smokers that they'll be able to continue to run. But once we have a 
stack of kelp blocks in each of these, it's going to be able to run for a while, and it actually won't produce kelp all that frequently. I mean, in the time that we've had it running here, it's produced maybe five or six stacks. I added a few stacks into this chest beforehand. We have all of this to smelt, but once the farm is just kind of casually running in the background without all of this backlog to deal with, it will only run every time the hopper minecart leaves this station, which should not be all that often. But as I mentioned earlier in the episode, in future we'll be able to have these blocks of dried kelp automatically crafted, at which point they could be fed back into the smoker array automatically, and we could end up with a self-sustaining kelp farm that would need no further input from the player. And that's an exciting prospect, but for now that's where we're going to leave this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this look at an automatic kelp farm and an automatic smoker to go alongside it. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.